All right, welcome everyone to the uh, Jacksonville Urban League Center for Advocacy and Social Justice. Right. Um, tonight we'll be talking about uh, criminal justice reform uh, through community engagement. Uh, this is part of a series of town halls that the Jacksonville Urban League and its Center for Advocacy and Social Justice has launched uh, to bring about a safer community. And we have um, an expert here tonight, and we will start with uh, a welcome from Dr. Uh, Richard Danford, our president, uh, if he is available. Dr. Danford? Yes, good evening, uh, Dennis and our guests. Just want to uh, say hello. We're happy that you're joining us this evening, and we look forward to a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Renee to get us started. I think Sebastian had something to say first. Uh huh. So uh, we have Sebastian Singh, who is a intern at the Center for Advocacy and Social Justice from the University of Virginia. Uh, also with us is Renee Bryan from the University of Virginia, an intern. Uh, Sophia Berger, also a, an intern. Jacqueline Small, Beth Kogan, uh, Jingyi Zhang, Kaziah Anderson, um, and Victoria Williams. And we are very grateful for the work that they're doing uh, to support us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sebastian. Sure. Um, so as Dennis said, I am an intern here at the CESJ, um, where I focus on issues like voter rights, um, children's rights, and what we're here to discuss today, um, criminal justice reform. So the purpose of this session is basically to listen to the community and get an understanding of what are the most important and urgent um, issues surrounding criminal justice reform in Jacksonville, and start delving into possible solutions for those issues. Um, so today we'll be hearing from um, Mr. Frazier, who is the president of the Northside Coalition of Jacksonville. Um, following that, we'll do a little poll um, to kind of identify some issues and get um, everybody thinking about these important issues, um, followed by a open discussion where we'll try to ad identify some problems as well as figure out how they're affecting people and figure out possible solutions. So without further ado, Renee, if you would uh, introduce Mr. Frazier. Good evening, everyone. Um, like Sebastian, Mr. Stone said, I'm Renee Bryan. I'm an intern with um, the Jacksonville Urban League. And our guest speaker for tonight is Mr. Ben Frazier, who is a Jacksonville native, a former member of the Jacksonville Journey and a longtime member of Bethel Baptist Institution Church. He is a reformed felon whose real life experiences on and off the streets lend great value to understanding and finding solutions on how to reduce violence. After nearly 50 years in the broadcasting industry, Mr. Frazier is well known locally and nationally. In 1979, this broadcast pioneer became the first African American in Jacksonville, Florida to anchor a major television news program. Mr. Frazier became the first news anchor of the WJXT TV4's Eyewitness News at Noon. In nearly 50 years as a journalist, Mr. Frazier's confident smile and his reassuring demeanor, Mr. Frazier has written extensively on the subject of African American history, and he is also the recipient of more than 200 awards for community service journalism um, from civic and social organizations in Jacksonville, Detroit, and Atlanta. Mr. Frazier's teamwork has gamered three nat nat three regional Emmy Awards for the best local newscast in Detroit and is also a documentary production. He has been honored by the City Council of Detroit as well as the Optimist Club Man of the Year. But now Frazier is blazing a new trail as a community activist. He is president and founder of the Northside, Co Northside Coalition of Jacksonville, a community advocacy group. The NCOJ has more than 2,000 online members and 100 members of its steering committee. In less than two years, the Northside Coalition has become the fastest growing and most active in local civil rights organization in Northern Florida. The Northside Coalition of Jacksonville is committed to serving residents and empowering the community. 
We are working hard to make positive changes in neighborhood by neighborhood, house by house. Mr. Frazier says we are attempting to address issues that are reaping havoc on the section of the city, which has been routinely ignored. With all of Mr. Frazier's experience and expertise, please welcome him as he shares some of his, shares his insight with us. Well, I'm certainly happy to be among you guys this evening. And I am hopeful that I'm coming in crisply and clearly uh, because we know that these Zoom meetings sometimes drop out and we have all kinds of technological problems. But right now, we uh, don't have any dogs barking in the background. And quite frankly speaking, I think we better use our time wisely. So what are we really talking about when we talk about criminal justice reform? And certainly we recognize there's a need for it. But what we're really talking about, I think, more than anything else is about public safety. That's the real issue here, because public safety, as we all know, underlies numerous uh, public policy decisions and laws and actually our day-to-day -day choices that we have to make in terms of our lifestyles every day. But again, we uh, kind of have to ask the question, what is public safety? Well, what we're talking about is the protection of the general public. As a matter of fact, it might be easier to define public safety uh, based on what happens if it's missing. Uh, you know, if you need a policeman and you call one and you can't get him, that's a major problem. That's not good news. But imagine what it would look like uh, in our workplace and in our everyday lives if we didn't have uh, first responders. But beyond uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, well-being, still that issue of public safety and criminal justice reform gets a little bit deeper than that. Uh, in the words of Abraham Maslow in his famous hierarchy of human needs model, he says that the issue of safety is one of the most fundamental needs that we have. Certainly we recognize that when we see so many acts of violence taking place in our neighborhoods. Take for example, Jacksonville, Florida. The crime rate overall is down, but we've got the murder rate that's up. So what does it all mean? It means that there's gun violence is taking place in our neighborhoods to a very high degree. Most of the murders, guns. So then, what do we do to deal with it? We've got to recognize that there are far too many guns in the hands of far too many people who should not have them. So we get cure violence. Somebody says, well, let's give cure violence a chance. They're going to interrupt violence by introducing credible messengers, meaning people who have been there, done that into the scenario, send them to the hospitals and send them to the streets to tell people who are committing these crimes, hey, stop it, stop the retaliatory violence that's going on. But in Jacksonville, Florida, has it worked? And the answer to that is a resounding no. So how are we going to deal with it? We've already studied it. We've done all the surveys. We've done all the polls. How do we actually move the needle in a positive and productive way towards reducing this violence? Well, as we look back last year, 2020, we get more murders last year than we've had since Lord knows when, since they started keeping the statistics. And we look at Jacksonville, Florida, and what do the statistics tell us about Jacksonville? Well, Jacksonville still has its dubious title of the murder capital of the state of Florida. And where do you think that those murders took place more than any other. You guessed it, zip code 32209. 
here's our premise and here's where I think we need to begin in terms of correcting it, in terms of reform. We've got to admit to this premise, this argument, that there is in fact a direct connection, an inextricable link, if you will, between poverty, unemployment, economic decay, gun violence, and crime. So that you can come up with all these other reforms that you want to come up with. You can come up with, well, we need more police officers. You can come up with, well, what we need is more technology, body cams, shot spotters. All these things happen after the event, after the crime has been committed. So if we're going to make any difference in terms of criminal justice reform, you've got to make it in the area of prevention and intervention. That's where you make your mark, not after the crime has been committed. Prevention and intervention. We've got to reach folks out there to interrupt this violence that's taking place, that's reaping havoc on our communities, our neighborhoods, our households, destroying our families. We've got to do something different because other than prevention and intervention, all you're really doing in terms of criminal justice reform is putting a Band-Aid on an open and hemorrhaging wound. Thank you for that, um, Mr. Frazier. Found that um, really insightful. Um, and before uh, we move on to the poll, I'd like to see if anybody had any uh, questions for um, Mr. Frazier. Or if not, I can start off with one um, that I just thought of. I guess I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so when you're thinking about like prevention and intervention, what exactly does that look like within the context of community activism um, and criminal justice issues? Did my uh, question come through, Mr. Frazier? Okay, uh, let me address the issue as best I can. I think your question is a good one. Uh, but let's talk about cure violence, for example. The city has expanded this program to several different zip codes. But this is a, uh, a model that's been used around the world and uh, it's been pretty successful. However, I think it has not been customized for Jacksonville. It's gotta be customized for Jacksonville. Jacksonville is not Chicago. Jacksonville is Jacksonville. It has its own subtle nuances. And I think that they have not been addressed adequately to adjust to the model. associations. I think you may have cut out a little bit um, there towards the end. Do you mind repeating that? Yes. What I'm suggesting is that Jacksonville has its own subtle nuances and that what we should do is adjust the cure violence model to Jacksonville and not vice versa. We need to involve associations and other organizations and certainly we need to be involved churches in the effort. We cannot begin to talk about ending violence in Jacksonville without the steadfast involvement of churches and their congregations right here. And it hasn't been enough of that in Jacksonville. This is a 
community problem and it's going to take a community solution to resolve it. We've got to work together in a way that we never have before. And I'm here to tell you that we can do it. Yes, we can. We need to put together, for example, a multimedia campaign saying stop the violence, to make stop the violence and increase the peace a regular saying, rather than say good morning to each other, we need to start saying, hey, stop the violence, increase the peace. We've got to make it a daily campaign that is a part of our very fabric in terms of the society here in Jacksonville. We need to see stop the violence written on buses, we need to see it written on billboards. We need to see it written on the side of buildings. We need to see stop the violence as a part of our effort to change the norm of violence in this city. I remember a story a couple of years back, only a few years, a guy is walking with his significant other in a park on the short side side of Jacksonville, the south, south side. There he is, forgive me. And he is walking with his significant other and their toddler. They become embroiled in some type of conflict verbally. Somebody pulls out a gun, shoots the guy in the head on a playground, in a, on a playground with other children on a sunny, Sunday afternoon. I can't think of anything more ridiculous. We've got to change that kind of norm that we begin to be, oh, well, somebody else got shot. No, we've got to reclaim our neighborhoods. We've got to talk to our young people and anybody else wielding these guns. And we've got to tell them we're not going to put up with it. We need to make clear that we're gonna have zero tolerance when it comes down to the shedding of bloodshed in our communities and particularly as it relates to our older people and our young people. We gotta let people know we're not gonna put up with it any longer. We've gotta change our attitude. You wanna change your public policies and your laws and so forth and so on, but that doesn't change people's hearts. It doesn't change people's heads. We got to let people know that there are some things we're not going to put up with. We've got to reclaim our neighborhoods. And if it means marching down the street 200 strong and talking to everybody we meet, then maybe that's what we need to do. We need to leave the church and walk out of the door and march down the street and talk to people and meet them where they are to encourage them and to lift them up. But they're also needs to be the economic issue that we mentioned earlier. And that is that there's a direct connection between what gun violence and economic decay. We've got to call for this city to put together a major massive Marshall Plan of Revitalization and Redevelopment, a multi-million dollar campaign to turn this thing around in terms of uh, providing for jobs. 32209, which is where these murders are occurring. The deadly zip code says so right here, 32209, Moncrief, Grand Park area, maintained its spot with the most homicides last year, 30. The closest to it was uh, 19, but that's where they're occurring in this area in some 10 block census areas of 32209, 50% of the people are living below federal poverty guidelines. You cannot ignore that. How much longer are you going to look the other way and act as if that stark, ugly, heinous, horrific fact is not occurring? We've got people who are dirt poor living around us and it's a shame. We're acting just like it doesn't even impact. 
or have any impact on what's going on. It does. We've got to get people jobs. We've got to get people working. We need to revitalize these communities. We need to redevelop them. And we need to stop discriminating against them geographically, not simply racially, but geographically. Maybe it is based on race, but we've got to stop it. We've got to give these folks a fighting chance. The only way we do that is to pump some money into these neighborhoods that we've been ignoring, marginalizing, and looking the other way for far too long, not just during certain mayoral administrations, whether it was Republican or Democrat, but for several generations, we've ignored these people. And I'm sick and tired of it. It's time to turn this around. We've got to treat people right. I just want to um, call attention to a question in the chat from Regina, who asked, can we effectively address gun violence and increasing the peace before we address poverty and unemployment? And if so, how? Good question. Well, you we look at these statistics thus far. We've been doing it that way for far too long. And the only thing that we've seen is an increase. What we've got going on right now is epic fail. We've already tried it the other way. We tried it by getting more police officers within the context of the past four years. And the only thing we've seen is the bloodshed has increased and the crime in terms of gun violence has only increased. No, we, we've got to deal with mental health issues. So many of these calls are mental health issues. We need to begin to deal with that. We need to have special folks going out on some of these calls who are trained to resolve conflicts. We got too many people who are being confronted with police involved violence in some instances where clearly there is excessive use of force and perhaps a different call could have been made. Maybe we need to do a better job at training our folks in terms of de-escalation of these police officers. Too many of them come into our community like warriors, not like servants who are sworn to serve and to protect. They come to us like strangers in a strange land. They and only 300 of them. I think you, you may have frozen again. Would you mind repeating um, the last part? We need to look at the numbers of sworn police officers. There are 1,500 in JSO. Only 300 of those are Black. That is ridiculous. We should no longer accept Mike Williams' excuses as to why he can't hire more black police officers. Are you gonna have all white folks policing black communities? We've got 280,000 black people here, about 30.03% uh, of the population, population of about 974,000. So the bottom line is we got 30%, but only 15% of the police force is black. It's something wrong here, folks. This is kind of like Soweto in South Africa with white folks largely in charge and calling all the shots in terms of policing. And I think you're cutting out again. We're not getting your audio. Gulf that is deep and wide as the culture is between black folks and white folks. And we know that's deep. Are there any other questions for Mr. Frazier? Yes, I had a question 
where in our community have you seen uh, people making progress, Mr. Frazier? Is there some areas that people are making progress on this? We can't, your, your audio is not, oh, we have to unmute. If there you're talking you. about progress, I think it's fair for you to define what you mean when you say progress, where people are making progress. What do you mean? Well, it seems to me you're, of all people, you would be one to, you've looked into this deeply, you've looked at, you know, what's happening. Let's, are there individuals that are actually getting something done, making a difference in the community? Um, and, and the reason I'm asking the question is because Obviously, we, we will learn from them what they're doing and be able to share that information um, with uh, you know, others that want to see positive change. I agree with you on everything you've said, by the way. Um, but I'm just curious, as you've, as you've looked at it, are there some folks that have, you know, despite the challenges, been able to do some things to make a difference? I, I think that um, we have notable... Uh, nonprofits and uh, organizations and individuals who are doing much to hold the line. Uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, this city is still standing because of the hard work of so many different nonprofit organizations and individuals, and for that matter, churches. I just think that there is a definitive need for more creative, compassionate, and courageous leadership from the top. I think that there's a need for there to be more compassion and creativity and leadership from City Hall. There's not nearly enough. We keep doing things the same ways. And if you continue to do the same thing the same ways, as we all know, you can expect to get what? The same results. So to answer your question, yes, there are many uh, groups that are doing different things in terms of mentorship, uh, tutoring programs. Some groups are actually starting to do things with regards to financial literacy training. Uh, churches, uh, there's some churches doing a whole lot in terms of feeding people. A lot of organizations, I'm not simply bad-mouthing everybody here, and, or for that matter, the city itself. I'm simply suggesting that we can and should do more, that we need to take a, a bigger bite. Uh, you know, uh, you, you, you can devour that elephant one bite at a time, but sometimes it's it's necessary to take a big bite. And I'm seeing. Two two nine and we need to the zip code three two two zero nine and start talking about forming partnerships between black entrepreneurs, young and old, and old line money at the Chamber of Commerce. Some of those big ballers and shot callers down there at the Chamber of Commerce, some white folks running major corporations need to form new partners with some folks on a different side of town in our neck of the woods. We need to start working together. Is that so novel, so crazy, a thought? that we become partners in progress, that we become a thriving commercial metropolis that is too busy to hate. I'm not proposing division. I'm promoting unity. I'm suggesting that if we work together and not simply make it some rhetorical term, that if we actually roll up our sleeves and start talking about providing, for example, incentives for businesses to
to relocate and hang their shingles in 32209. You want to give Shad Khan $300 million when he's good for $900 million by himself? What does he need help for? They need help in 32209. Give some businesses some incentives to start and hang and build lawyers' offices, dentists' offices, and, and doctors' offices in 32209. Bring some businesses there. Encourage businesses to relocate in 32209, 32206 on the east side, uh, 17,000 people, 34,000 people in 32209. Let's start talking about setting up some music venues, some restaurants, sit down restaurants. What about a movie theater? Why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we dreaming big dreams in this area rather than talking about crime stats? What I'm suggesting is there needs to be creative, compassionate, and courageous leadership. We need to dream some big dreams, folks. We can do it. We can work together. We can make it happen. We can turn Myrtle Avenue upside down in a positive way. Kings Road, right going right past Edward Waters College. Why don't we have venues where there are Black theatrical groups, uh, Jacksonville Black Repertory Company? Where is it? We need to create it. What about Sutel? From Lem Turner to US 1, we see nothing but a few churches, a ballpark, and a few barbershops. No sit down restaurants. What is going on? We're okay with that? Not to try to build this area up? Why aren't we talking about economic injustice? There is some serious economic injustice going on. If you are honest, if you look at it and you, you give me your evaluation, your examination and your review, you'll see that these people have been ignored. Folks, they've been ignored for generations to our own detriment as a city. I'm here to tell you we can, yes, we can. That's my message, yes, we can. We can turn this around. We can make this area a thriving commercial metropolis a city that is too busy to hate, if we just roll up our sleeves, get beyond uh, the whole issue of racial divide and start working together to give this city the kind of name it should have, the kind of reputation it should have. We can make this a model for other cities across the United States if we just learn how to work together. Thank you for that answer. I actually visited Denver last week and there is an historic district in Denver yes. that has all the things that you're talking about. Music and performance and, and stores and uh, partnerships um, and very successful. Uh, that's, good just, no, that's good to know. Denver, you say? Uh, Denver, Denver, Colorado. Well, we need to look into that. Yeah, I think it'd be well worth visiting. Yes, sir. That sounds like a good idea. The other thing that the Urban League has been doing is uh, developing its economic empowerment center to do what you're talking about and to build mentorships for um, Black businesses. So starting in the best we can with what we, what we have, and we, we're hoping to do more and more. That, that's, we're, we're, go that's, ahead. That's very good. And again, my ambition is to encourage any organization, any individual who's already moving in any of the directions I've suggested, we just gotta get more people working with you. <laughs> That's all it is to it. We need to work, we need to begin to collaborate. And that's another problem, I think, uh, that we're not actually hitting on quite hard enough. It is where our missions and our messages intersect is where our collaboration should begin. Mm -hmm. We gotta work more together. Some of us are working so hard in our various silos, we don't know what the hell is happening with anybody else. 
we got to change that. We got to work together. For it. That's great. Um, Sebastian, did you want me to start the poll now or and then we could come back and address some of the issues based on what we see in the poll? Seems like uh, Monica might have a quick question. If, if you want to go ahead and unmute Monica, we could go to the poll after that. Yes. Hi, sorry. So I'm just a Jacksonville native myself. And you brought up some very interesting points that I just wanted to have a little bit of elaboration on. So talking about like helping out zip codes like 32209, I, as someone from Jacksonville, I recognize that the problems in the city seem to affect a small population and the rest of it seems to completely ignore it. How do you think one should go forward trying to bring you know, these wealthier parts of the city to get them to start caring or trying about the parts of the city that need help? I think that um, much of what we are up against is uh, some old fashioned uh, things like truth. Truth. You know, the, the old line is that uh, there are three sides to every story, your side, my side, and the truth. And for too long, Jacksonville has lived a lie. Uh, there's been too much of this old boy circuit stuff, cronyism, nepotism, leaving people out, women been left out, other folks of different persuasion, black folks racially left out. Folks, if we're going to move forward, we've got to leave all that foolishness behind. We got to leave the Civil War behind. And that whole mentality and that whole attitude, folks, I'm just so naive as to believe that attitude determines altitude. I don't think that we'll all sit around the campfire and sing, come by here anytime soon. But damn it, we ought to try. We need to stop talking about what divides us and start talking about what unites us. Talk about those things on which we agree. We've got a lot going here in Jacksonville, Florida. We like seafood down here. We like barbecuing down here. We like eating crabs and stuff like that and frying fish and eating grits. We like mac and cheese and we like collard greens and ain't nothing wrong with that. We need to start celebrating and being proud of who we are in terms of our culture and as a city. We need to start defining and rebranding who we are. We got a river that cuts right through the middle of our city. One of the prettiest rivers in the world. Catch a lot of fish there too. We need to start being proud of this city. We need to start saying nice things about the city, but we can't say nice things if we keep doing bad things. This whole racial issue, it's time for us to chunk it, folks. It's time to get rid of this foolishness. You want what I want. A big house, a good SUV, a little dog that goes bow wow. You want to be able to send your children to school, get a good education, just like me. We have a right to be proud of who we are, regardless of what package we come in. Now, it's time for us to push this 19th century baloney behind us and to start moving forward in a positive and productive way and with faith. I believe we can do it, folks. I just believe we can do it. I think that we need to stand up and speak out against any form of social, racial, and economic injustice. I think we ought to do it. We ought to let people know we don't like racism. Somebody in City Hall ought to say, you know what? It's time for us to end discrimination. It's time for us to start treating people right. It ought to be part and parcel of every policy and every law that we write. It's time for us to work together as a community in a way that we never have before. Who's ready for it and who's not? Because the folks who are not, we need to vote them from out of office. We need to move to get them to resign or we need to move to recall them. The folks who don't wanna see everybody move forward are not on our side and they're not for this city. They're just for themselves. 
We can't just let the same folks keep making the same money and leaving other people behind. No, folks, it's time to give everybody a fair shot. Time for everybody to have a good opportunity to make it in this city. We need to work together. That is what I would like for my legacy to be about. Let's work together and oh yeah, I do believe in the word love. And yes, what the world needs now and what Jacksonville needs now is love and unity. Mr. Frazier, um, I think Regina had a question in the chat. She asks, which is the greater need for 32209? Incentives for businesses to relocate to the zip code? Incentives for affordable housing to be built in the zip code? or incentives for multi-use properties in the zip code? Well, come on, it's gotta be all three. Can't just be one thing and not the other. Uh, yeah, safe, decent and affordable housing is absolute and necessary. Uh, multi-use uh, property uh, incentives, yes, we, we need that. But it's not just one or the other. Uh, I mean, you can assign some priority to it if you'd like. But one of the things that we have to be concerned about is uh, returning citizens. So many people who live in that zip code have backgrounds that, uh, uh, you know, involve jail and prison life. We've got to take, for example, Kevin Gay's Operation New Hope from just uh, operating on Main Street to franchising it in 32208, 32209 and giving those folks an offer chance, uh, a chance to, to start over again. People need to be given a second chance. Sometimes they need a third chance, but that's okay too. As long as they wanna change for the better, we need to try to help folks. So no, I couldn't assign anything uh, in terms of Virginia, in terms of uh, priorities for those three things. All three of those things are certainly needed. I think uh, this would be a good time to uh, send out the poll if we could do that um, and then discuss a little bit about uh, the results from, from those questions. Okay, here it goes. It's possible to um, share those answers. Sure. Awesome. All right. So it looks like um, accountability and transparency was sort of a clear uh, outlier there, um, and that it's seventy-three percent of um, us said that it was the most important uh, area of policing reform. Uh, would anybody like to indicate why they have that feeling? Um, and give us a little insight into that. Mr. Fraser, feel free to pitch in. As well. well, I was kind of hoping that somebody else would have something to say about that. I've been pushing for trust, transparency, and accountability for about five years, Duval County uh, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. You remember when we had that walking uh, while black issue? And they were actually writing black people more jaywalking tickets mm -hmm. than they were in white neighborhoods. I mean, can you think yeah. of anything yeah. any more insane than that? I mean, that you don't have to be Martin Luther King Jr. to say that's unfair. I mean, they, they got people walking across the street with beer in their hands on the beach. <laughs> and 
how you know better than saying anything to anybody leaving the brick in Avondale or Riverside about, uh, you know, walking across the street. Come on. This is in, insanity. And then they actually were writing tickets. And the reason that they were doing it was to stop people so that they could see whether they could get them on some other crime. Mm -hmm. Folks, that's called pro. Mm -hmm. I think you're cutting out, Mr. Frazier. He even crunched the numbers. So I talked to the sheriff about those uh, jaywalking tickets two times. He stood up right there in front of me and, and told me, oh, no, we're not doing this. I mean, you call that transparency? That's not what we call transparency where I'm from. We call that lying. How are you going to have a sheriff who won't come clean about something as obvious as that? All he had to say was, you know what? For whatever reason, we were doing that. I looked into it. I don't like that. It doesn't look fair. And you know what? I'm going to cut that out. You think he said that? No, he didn't. Okay, now, that's an easy one. As far as I'm concerned, that was low hanging fruit. He could have used that to his benefit and said, hey, we're gonna cut that out. That's not fair to people. Did he say that? No. Do you call that creative relationship leadership? Do you call that compassionate leadership? Do you call that courageous leadership? I call it wimping out. It's time for somebody with courage, some of these elected officials to stand up with what they used to call intestinal fortitude. Of course, we know he goes by a different name as well, but uh, we need somebody who's going to stand up. If you don't stand up for, for something, you'll do what? You'll fall for anything. I don't know if everybody can see the chat, but there seems to go to be like a kind of side or parallel conversation going on about community policing and transparency and how we could reach a truly equitable community safety and realistic policing. Um, so if you guys have any thoughts on that, um, please feel free to say it out loud or um, add to the conversation in the chat. This is definitely super helpful. And then we also, sorry, go ahead. Yes, uh, what we push for is a community uh, citizens review board, uh, which is kind of making its way uh, through the uh, cycle right now with the George Morgan uh, committee. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, Dr. Hodo uh, and her final recommendations will be standing up for that kind of review. A committee that would look at uh, allegations of police misconduct in Duval County. We think that there's a need for that. We understand that there are certain charter questions that have to be answered, maybe even some state statute questions as it relates to uh, qualified immunity for police officers. But even so, we want somebody who will stand up for what's right. I don't care if it's, if it's not gonna happen in one final vote this session of the city council. I just want somebody who's gonna stand up but what's right? That's the kind of representatives we need out of that 19 member city council. We need somebody who's gonna stand up for what's right and best for the constituency, even though it may not be politically popular, might even be political suicide, but regardless, we need somebody who's gonna stand up for what's right. That was a great um, bit of discussion there. I think we have some three more questions. Um, Renee, if you could uh, send those off. Looks like the, the first one is a repeat, but the others uh, are new.
feel free to uh, send the results out whenever um, it looks like all of us voted. See if we can just get a few more. Up to 84%. All right, so for the second question, um, this seems pretty interesting here. Um, sort of uh, not quite equal, but very close between who should be held responsible for a juvenile delinquency um, in parents versus society. So if anybody would like to, uh, to speak on that and why they chose one over the other, um, I'd love to hear. Well, while everybody else is waiting to make up their mind, <laughs> I'm kind of torn on that one. And you can see that a lot of people are. You look at those uh, statistics there, 45, 55. You know, I, I don't want to sound like, uh, what was it, Denzel? Uh, I don't want to sound like uh, even Bill Cosby was into that, right? Because I recognize it as it relates to parents that they're impacted by, uh, by the uh, politics of these various policies, structural and systemic racism. Uh, they're, they're all affected. You can't just tear them apart from that. Um, but ultimately, I suppose, um, yeah, I do believe that parents ought to tighten up. I do, I do believe that, uh, regardless of what society does. I do think that we need to tighten up as parents. In other words, I mentioned earlier that there are too many guns in the hands of too many people who should not have them. And I know this is an issue for many Black families. I know that there are people who see kids coming home with guns. They know that they have these guns. Uh, and it's just not working out, especially for young black men. If you look at the, uh, the people with deaths, for example, due to gun violence, it says right here in front of me, the age of victims, 21 to 30 year old bracket showed the most deaths. 61, followed by 31 to 40 year olds, 41. In the teen vicinity, 31 were killed who were 11 to 20 years old. And only three victims were older than 70 and five children were younger than 10. Uh, African-Americans of course suffered the most deaths, 132. Uh, compared by 34 whites and eight has Hispanics and one Asian. So out of the about 100, buck 85, buck 75 people killed, uh, 132 African-Americans and that category of 21 to 30, damn it, man, 61? I mean, it's like, uh, Brother, 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 there's too many of you dying. Mother, 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 too many of you crying. We've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. 
what's going on. Does anyone else have anything to say? I think that in a way, um, the society and parents are kind of almost intertwined because a lot of the um, parenting, I guess you could say, mis like misgivings or that are happening are a res direct result of resources and the way society treats underrepresented and marginalized peoples. And so I think it goes back to the whole issue of resources and the root causes. And I don't think any parent is like, okay, well, I'm just not going to give my child X or I'm not going to be here at this time. Um, I think it has to do with the lack of resources in these communities. And so I think that it's interesting that the boats are kind of split I can see two things because I think they are very related and similar. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head with that one. Preach. That takes us uh, perfectly into the, the next polling question, um, which is what resources do you think would be most helpful for improving safety in your community? Um, and financial uh, was the, the most uh, answered question there. Uh, with 45% um, saying financial resources, 27% social, and 18% political, and 9% other. Um, so I know Mr. Fraser talked before about how um, these financial resources are more important as he sees it than, than policy, than basically doing what we've been doing. Um, but I'd also like to hear from whoever may have said other uh, to see what they might think is the most helpful in improving safety community, as well as the people who said social. Man, I just mentioned, uh, uh, I don't mean to divert your question, but Renee's comment on the chat was just uh, so good. Uh, she was saying that the uh, areas that are most safe are not necessarily the ones with the most police, but rather the ones with the most resources. Wow, that's a telling comment and it's such a strong comment because I'm looking at statistics that talk about the zip code. And while we mentioned 32209, uh, a few of these zip codes had zero homicides. I mean, zero, they include 32207, 32212, 32219, 32222, 32228, 32258, and 32073. Now, I'll bet you if you put that one under the microscope, it would bear out just what uh, Renee was saying in her comment. The safest communities are the ones with the most resources, not necessarily the most police presence. Strong comment. Thank you for that, Renee. Would anyone else like to say anything about that question or, or otherwise to the point that um, Mr. Fraser was making? If not, we can move on to the last question, which was, do you feel courts in Jacksonville deal with criminals too harshly or not harshly enough? Um, and 82% of you said too harshly. 9% said just right, and 9% said I do not know. Um, so if anyone would like to share why they responded, how they responded, um, we'd love to hear. I think that there is a uh, con uh, connection almost uh, with the Fourth Judicial Circuit, as there is with JSO and the 1,500 sworn police officers, and it only being uh, 300 uh, Black police mm -hmm. officers. Now look at the makeup of the court system. Of 55 judges, only five of those people are women. I don't know how they managed to come up with that or not, but to, to, to me, that's kind of like discrimination. I don't care how you cut it, whether they voted them in or whatever, man, that is just,
think you uh, may be cutting out. Oh, Mr. Pleasure. I think you may have cut out again there. Okay. Uh, we we're going to move away from the question of the lack of women on the bench, which has been obvious discrimination, but obvious discrimination as well, with reference to the number of blacks on the bench, meeting out justice, 55 judges in the fourth judicial circuit and I think Mr. Frazier cut out again, but I think a lot of what he's trying to cover goes into voter representation and getting people out to the polls. I think a lot of minority communities do not vote or do not know they need to vote or they only vote in presidential elections. And the most important elections do are the primaries where you vote into people who represent you and represent what you believe in into judge judges or um, into local offices and local elections. And I think that's a little bit of what Mr. Frazier is trying to talk yeah, about. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's clearly uh, where I'm going. And that, that is to say that black voters matter. The fact of the matter is that for whatever reason, there are not enough black judges. You can point the finger wherever you want to point it at the black folks who don't go to the polls or the issue that there are not enough of them running or have the means to run. But the bottom line is we need to change that around. We need to move to change that around because clearly too many white judges are passing and meeting out justice on black defendants, period. Yeah, I'd, I'd add too that uh, as somebody who worked on this for many, many years to try to change the color of the legal profession. Yes, sir. Um, when we started Florida Coastal School of Law here in Jacksonville 25 years ago, 95% mm -hmm. of the, uh, the bar was white mm -hmm. and was Caucasian. And of those Caucasians, very few were Hispanic. Mm -hmm. The numbers aren't too different today, despite wow. all the work we did um, to make a difference. Um, it's you get back to these statistics and people are looking at money and societal, social restraints yeah. that limit the, uh, the rise of certain children. Um, indeed, ensure that they never get a chance to even stay alive for very long. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to add is the... Um, in terms of the judiciary uh, is our pretrial detention problem. You know, if you don't have the money to pay bail, you in, in essence are convicted right there. You sit in jail waiting for a hearing. And, and so you can't work. Your family has more problems. You, your children have problems. It's just not right. And it's to, to use the bail system um, for what used to be a real problem, which was what people would leave town and disappear. Well, they can't do that anymore. And it doesn't happen. It's something like 2% of people actually jump bail. Maybe it's even one. So it's just, um, it's just not right. Um, and we need to tackle that. If that's speaking of low hanging fruit, that's an easy one. Um, and there are a number of, uh, lawyers who are very concerned about this and trying to uh, put pressure on the judiciary to make a change. But that's, that's a sad situation right there. And you know who those people are, um, what the color of their skin is, the majority of them being stuck in and not being able to afford to get out. Um, so that's a big problem with the judiciary right now. I would also like to get your perspective on something I mentioned in the chat. So Duval County has a bunch of prisons within its borders, but also our neighboring counties have large prisons around it as well. And these prisons donate a lot of money to a lot of local campaigns. So then a bunch of the leadership within Jacksonville is on the side of keeping these prisons full. How do you think we could begin to combat that? 
Well, that, that sounds like a great question for a lawyer. <laughs> I'll probably give you a, a lawyer's answer. It depends. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, um, Supreme Court uh, did a great injustice to us when they um, allowed these campaigns to um, almost um, without any accountability pour money into um, uh, people running for office, and we need change there. So, you know, we really need change. I've been, what's been ringing in my head for the last two weeks is um, I saw a video of um, Greta Thunberg's last speech, latest speech on climate change. And she said, it's time to stop playing roles. Mm -hmm. There are people playing roles. They got to take their costumes off and be real. Wow. Because in her mind, you know, she's talking about climate change. Uh, science is not stopping. Physics is not stopping. Chemistry is not stopping. It's time to take off the costumes. Yeah. And do your job. And that's the same thing with regard to this problem. People have to stop pretending. They have to start owning up to what reality is and put the money where it's needed. We've got plenty of it. We're rolling in it right now with the federal government's help, with the uh, state government help. We need, we need to do something and uh, to help those zip codes, Health Zone 1. Very good. And to your point, uh, ma'am, the fact of the matter is crime does pay for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. And it's usually not the criminal. It's usually not the person convicted. I mean, the system is filled with people who are profiting uh, from uh, the crimes that are alleged or are being committed. It starts with uh, the people who make the lunches for the people in jail or court reporters and attorneys and judges. I mean, no, it is the, the system is kind of like uh, designed to make money on crime. If it, uh, these people stop. anyone else like to add anything? If not, I'll hand it over to Dennis. Oh, let's see here. I see Richard. Uh, uh, President Danford is still on. Would you like to give us a, some closing re remarks? Hello, Dennis, can you hear me? Yes. Good, good. <clears throat> First of all, uh, let me just uh, send a shout out to, uh, to Ben Frazier. Uh, ben is, uh, he's a real soldier. I want you to know that, Ben. Uh, you've been at it a long time in this community. Um, you know, you've, uh, You've advocated for some major issues in our community and I applaud your work. You know, I applaud your stick to itness. Um, we certainly need more warriors like you. Um, you know, we're moving on fast. We've got to look at training some young people. Uh, that's why we're so uh, fortunate to have <clears throat> the caliber of interns that, that we have working with us, you know, that are forcing us to look at issues that are 
that we need to deal with in our community. There are no quick fixes. Um, and I certainly commend you for, for keeping us uh, focused on, on the things that are troubling our community. This is, this is hard work. Um, and you do it without, uh, without a lot of pay. I don't see a lot of pay, but uh, I know it's in your heart. And uh, so if I can only do one thing is that is to encourage you and to work with us as we look at how we bring the communities together. You know, we've got to find a way. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned the churches on several occasions. You know, granted, we have many ministers and Congregate congregations doing doing a yeoman job, you know, and obviously there are organizations in our community that are working hard. You know, we're all somewhat uh, tapping around the edges uh, on, on many of these issues, but if we can find a way to come together on some of them, I mean, really come together. And we talk about trust and transparency uh, in the criminal justice system. You know, we need uh, we need more trust and transparency in our communities. We need more <clears throat> we need we need more people to step up politically to run for office. You know, there are lots of folk out there with the capacity to really help us move some things, but they're reluctant to run. You know, we hear so much about the fact that you need so much money to run in an election. And what we have oftentimes are people that are looking for a job running. You need people that are running to help the community that they're supposed to serve. So I'll, I'll close with that. Uh, again, uh, you know, thank you, Dennis. Uh, thank the interns. Uh, you know, we've, we've, got, we've got to keep putting this out there. Uh, we're not going away. And uh, we're gonna continue to work to find solutions where, and also where we can get the community more engaged. So we will loop back, Ben. Uh, to the Neighborhood Bill of Rights uh, that has not been codified. So, so we can talk all we want about uh, fairness in city government. Citizens basically do not have any rights when it comes to providing opportunities for input and for engagement in the processes of the city. So thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ben, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Well, I'd just like to say thank you to each and every one of you. And I'm so happy to see that there are so many young folks who are now accepting the baton in the relay race of history, regardless of what package you come in. You know, throughout history, we see that there have been many people who stood up for something and it's so good to see that you have this opportunity uh, through the Urban League, an association that I have had. It goes back to the days of Panzel Brown and now to uh, Dr. Danford, who's been with this organization for over 30 years. Thank you for providing an opportunity for these young folks and providing an opportunity for the people of Jacksonville. And we applaud your leadership and we would be remiss if we did not applaud your leadership for over the past 30 years, leading this organization to deal with relevant issues in this city. And I'd like to, to leave you with the words of one of my favorite artists, that artist being Michael Jackson, who said, I don't know about you and I don't know what your pronoun is, but I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways and
Mr. Frazier, we uh, we couldn't hear if you've uh, allow me out. allow me to simply say thank you on the part of the Northside Coalition of Jacksonville. As it relates to change, I said I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways, and no message could ever have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, then take a look at yourself and make that change. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Frazier. I echo everything that was said. Um, by uh, Dr. Danford and some of the words in the chat. We really appreciate uh, what you're doing, what you've done and the legacy you're leaving to Jacksonville. And um, I have my 101 year old mother visiting uh, this week and uh, we want you to be around just as long. So we need you take care of yourself and mentor those young people. And Amen. Once again, Amen. And once again, thanks to uh, all of the uh, interns that have put this together. We're broadcasting on um, uh, Facebook, and we have this recorded for the future. And it's we're really grateful for all the work you've done for us. And with that, we'll sign off and um, encourage you to come tomorrow night. We have a uh, town hall on the impact of voter suppression on the disabled, which uh, is just a travesty. And you'll hear, hear all about it tomorrow um, at six o'clock, uh, same time, same station. Congratulations. You guys do great work. Thank you, sir. Good night, everyone. <laughs>